Can you see this? Uh, you know, to me, when we talk about science, poverty, and sustainable water, uh, will these things ever coalesce? They have not in the past. And to expect that they will automatically coalesce because we say it should is expecting a bit too much. Uh, there are severe problems in each one of those words. And uh, to me, this particular picture taken in Lahore in Pakistan uh, symbolizes, you know, here is a lady selling strawberries on a donkey cart using a mobile phone to connect to her customers. On the background, you see mobile towers and high voltage transmission towers, and you see medieval Mughal ruins. You know, I mean, you couldn't have more transition uh, you know, between ages, between time, between technologies. You know. And even the product that she's uh, selling, it's a very exotic product. Only the elites of Pakistan in Lahore would use that to, for their ice cream. It's not a traditional product. But the lady obviously has gotten out of poverty uh, with some of these changes, changes in, in, in cropping, changes in technology, and several things. So what we are really talking about is we're talking about trying to link science and technology. We're trying to link that to poverty. We're trying to also talk about sustainability. And we're also talking about development. Each one of them is a highly, highly controversial topic. You know. And on top of it, you have water, energy, uh, water for health and food that we're talking about. And these are acted upon by policy, as we call it. It's a sanitized word. Uh, it actually means power political power, and power of different types. So what we have is something coming apart, not coming together. And what I want to do with you today is, you know, is try to talk about what is coming apart and what might come together. I'm not sure. But I have some ideas. You may agree or disagree with uh, what I've been saying. Now, this is a favorite picture of mine. You think you are seeing a truck. If you're a drone operator sitting somewhere in Colorado with one of these fancy satellites looking down, high resolution, you probably see this and you can send your drone to blow it to bits saying it's run by Taliban or whatever. The trouble is it's not a truck. It looks like a truck. It quacks like a truck. It's not a truck. It's an irrigation pump. And the story behind this is very funny. The story is uh, the Indian Rural Development Bank, Nabada, whatever it's called, uh, gives loans, very cheap loans, to farmers to buy pumps, irrigation pumps. And the problem is they give loans for three horsepower pumps because the engineers and economists decided that it takes three horsepower to pump the water. The trouble is the farmers take the soft loan but add their own money by pawning their wife's jewelry you know, to buy a 10 horsepower pump. And all the engineers and economists at the Nabard Bank Say the farmers are stupid. You know, uh, a colleague from China this morning, you know, mentioned that uh, you know the farmers are not stupid. It's the engineers and the economists who are stupid, because the farmers know that if you buy a three horsepower pump, you can only use it for 2,000 hours a year maximum to pump water, and the rest of the time it'll rust in a go down. Okay, if you buy a 10 horsepower pump, you use 2,000 hours of pumping, and roughly 6,000 hours you fit it on a chassis. And it's a, it's a truck, transports goods, and pays your loan off in two, two years instead of seven years. And that's what's happening. So the farmers are much smarter than the engineers and the economists. Okay. The trouble is, as you notice, this does not have a license plate. It was being driven at that time by, I think, a 12-year-old boy, which I'm sure that didn't have a license. So what is happening is what you are seeing is not what is there in reality. So the question is, what kind of science are we doing? And what, you know, you use this high satellite science and you see a truck. Well, you do a different type of science and you see that it's an irrigation pump. Now, this is where the problem lies with science and the kind of science uh, that we are doing. Okay. Now, my problem is, where does this blindness come from? The scientific blindness, you might say. And my argument is this is not the only one. If you look at my country's data right now, we have 15 to 18 hours of power cuts a day. Electric power, the utility switches off. There isn't enough. The demand is much higher than the supply. 
So you read official data, UN data, whatever data of my country, and it'll show you that you know we have so many kilowatt hours of per capita, whatever, whatever. Yeah, sounds correct. 700 megawatts of installed capacity in the national grid. Well, that's what it is. The trouble is, you know, private housing complexes, you know, shopping complexes, etc., have added 700 megawatts of diesel capacity already, and that's invisible. It's not on the statistics. It's not on the records. And that 700 is equivalent to the national grid, which took us 100 years to build, whereas this one has happened in the last three, four years. So what goes out of the window again is, well, the standard logic. Nepal is a poor country, doesn't have enough money, so there must be foreign aid to build hydropower plants. Wait a minute, they're sinking in money because they're building 700 megawatts of diesel plant on their own, paying 10 times the rate for electricity. Now, where does this blindness come from? Now, this is the kind of question that uh, we need to be asking. This is my another favorite cartoon. It was drawn by a Mekong cartoonist while I was giving a talk like this. What you see, you know, is a phenomenon that, well, I talked about Colorado, but it happens in North Nepal, Trans Himalaya, and the Tibetan Plateau also. Uh, you know, it's so high and so dry that when you're driving towards a thunderstorm and you see thunder and lightning, and a column of rain coming down, and you reach the place, and you find out that it's dry, bone dry. What happens is it's high, dry, low, low, low air pressure. The drop of rain never hits the ground. It evaporates before it really hits the ground. Now, I find this highly symbolic because much of the talk on Millennium Development Goal and all these fancy things, you know, has thunder and lightning at the international and national level, but at the level of the farmers down below, not a drop. I challenge you to go find any one farmer, and at least in Nepal, I'm sure in India or even in Africa, who's heard of MDG or SDG. Their life goes on without any MDGs and SDGs that seems to drive a lot of us crazy, you know, talking about all kinds of things in, in seminars. Now, so what I argue is that, you know, you have two types of science that we need to start considering, eagle eye science and toad's eye science. Eagle Eye Science, I get PhD students coming saying, I want to do research, what do you want to do? It says global satellite mapping and, you know, GIS and all that. I am just looking for a student who wants to go to a village and find out exactly how water is used and what's happening. That's Toad's Eye Science. And Toad's Eye Science has depth, but Eagle Eye Science has perspective. Okay, I admit, neither is sufficient, both are necessary. But the problem we have right now in southern countries and developing countries is there's not enough towards eye science. And much of what you see, the data you see and all, that is all generated from eagle eye science, which is missing many of the things that's happening on the ground. And that's where every policy seems to go completely uh, uh, wrong. Now, this is standard rural and urban, again. You do a different type of science, and you suddenly find out that, yeah, you have rural development departments and you have urban planning departments and all. What we are finding out is that's not true. You have something like this. You have an overlap. You can go to a village in Nepal that's three days from the nearest road, or four days from the walking from the nearest road, and you find out that, yeah, obviously that's a rural, right? Yeah. But then you go and look at the income basket of that household, and you suddenly find out that only 40% of the income of that household is coming from rural sources. 60% of the income of that household, if you're doing towards eye science, you find out, is coming from Dubai, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Tokyo, Vienna. You know, uh, I was stunned to find in Japan that there are 4,000 Nepali restaurants all over Japan, okay, in every railway station. Okay. It's, it's really funny. So all this thing is happening. So what you really have is not really rural and urban, which are vanishing ends of the spectrum. You have Desakota. This is a Basha Indonesia term used by East West Central Hawaii researchers uh, and hijacked by me afterwards now. And it basically means neither urban nor rural, or maybe both. Okay. Now, what this does, it is changes completely the way you need to think about policy. You know? And how people are responding in those villages is they're only 40% rural. They're 60% urban. And as urban as you want them to be. And their behavior pattern, their consumption pattern, their aspiration patterns are similarly sort of divided. 
Pakistan, where we tested this in this very lawless land called Baluchistan in uh, Quetta, which is the capital, and two villages next to it, uh, uh, Mastug and Pishing, you find out that these green and red lines, what they basically tell you is urban institutions, you know, laws, municipalities, rules, etc., start declining as you get out of the urban area very fast. And then you find out that the rural institutions of clan, religious, you know, all these things that keep your forest intact and your water sources intact, they start declining as you come towards the city. And right in the center over here, you know, is this sort of no man's land, you know, that area of Desakota, which is both rural and urban. It's, yes, it's slightly lawless in the sense that the rural institutions have declined and urban institutions haven't quite caught up. But at the same time, what you have is these are the areas of incubation where an irrigation pump can become also a truck. It's not possible in an urban area or in an urban setting. Okay. So what uh, essentially what we have is this framing that we used to try to understand the phenomenon. We're talking poverty and those standard things like $1 per day or $2 per day access entitlement, you know. We're talking about water-based ecosystem services. You know? At the same time, we have to talk about political economy, migration, consumerism, industrialization, commercialization, urbanization. We also have to talk about global changes, climate, et cetera, et cetera, uh, land degradation, biodiversity, all sorts of things going on. Now, what is going on, and you find out that poverty is linked to political economy through vulnerability, and you find out that water-based ecosystem services is linked to global environmental change through uncertainty, scientific. So there's physical uncertainty and social vulnerability. And you have social sciences and natural science, and you have this whole desiccator phenomenon in between of large, we did this for Africa, we did this for Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, China, and South Asia. And this is where you find out that you know, something else is going on, and we need to redefine the way we look at our problem. This after we did the study in Gujarat in India and Tamil Nadu in South India and Nepal. Groundwater overdraft, big problem. Large areas of Gujarat and India is going to, in the next five years, will probably be out of reach for irrigation because the groundwater table has de declined so disastrously. The trouble is the social response to that one groundwater decline problem is very, very plural. It's not simple. On the one hand, you know, you have the market forces, market individualism. I have the money, I pay for it, I pump the water, I grow avocados, I sell it in the market, make my money. You know, what's the problem? Okay. Everybody else's well is going dry. That's the problem. Now, typical response on the other side, the village headman type, you know, who thinks that groundwater laws and rules and regulations will solve the problem. Yes, they are necessary, but not sufficient. Because something else is happening. You have the angry activist egalitarian who just doesn't like Either the government, he thinks the government is stupid and he doesn't like the market because he thinks the market is greedy. Okay. And you also have the fate list, you know, what to do. So that fate list just out migrates to the urban slums to, to make do with things because it just can't survive in the villages. There's no water. Okay. It's a rather complicated diagram that basically argues that, you know, we're used to thinking of water in terms of science as H2O. Well, that's fine with the physical sciences. Even there, you have heavy water, light water, okay. Socially, in terms of social science, we have at least four types of water. We have private water, you know, all this bottled water, private, glamorized, and so on and so forth, tankers, you know. You have public water, the municipal supplies, regulated. You can get a two-inch pipe, you can get a one-inch pipe, and so on and so forth. You know, you get water five hours a day, you get water two hours a day, rules, regulations, so on. And most of social science has remained stuck here between the private and the public, uh, private partnership and public-private partnership or whatever we talk about. What has been forgotten is the other diagonal, which has the activist egalitarians here who are arguing about, against resource depletion and you know, really talking about common pool goods. Water as a common pool good, not a private good, not a public good. And you are the fatalist for whom water is a club good. They are excluded from the club. That's what they are. So you find out that, you know, just, you know, two discriminators that we use produces four styles of organizing, four styles, four views of nature, four views of risk, and so on, that produces a scenario where, um, where um, 
you can see if you take the fatalist out for a while, because fatalists don't strategize, it's the other three, individualism, hierarchism, and egalitarianism that strategize, fatalists are strategized upon. If they strategize, they would no longer be fatalists. And what you then generally have with bureaucratic hierarchism, it's coercive power. We have the laws, we have the rules. If you don't follow the rules, we put you in jail. Okay, that's what it is. And the whole idea is control. Okay. And the best social science that is loved in that social end of the triangle is law. Redistributive balance. And it's the politics is Nehruvian after Mr. Nehru in India, you know, socialism, commanding heights of the economy, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, you come to the other market, individualism, and here the problem is suddenly, you know, resource is abundant. We can invent our way out of the problem. Just get rid of the regulatory restrictions and we will easily, you know, get, give us the freedom to network and we will find the solution. We will invent our way out of the problem. Markets are great at invention. There's no doubt about it, okay? Producing iPads and iPhones and all sorts of, you know, devices. But the problem here is, and this is a Reagan or Thatcherite politics, you know, you find out there's another set of people who think, would define the problem very differently. And they define it as the egalitarian de definition is there is profligacy and that's the problem. Mahatma Gandhi's famous sentence, you know, the world has enough for our needs but not enough for our greed, is a classic egalitarian statement. Okay. And here, you again find the social science that they love is critical anthropology. The social science they love here is liberal economics. Now, you suddenly find out that, uh, that uh, the definition of a problem, of this water stress and insecurity problem, there are three, three definitions. You know, one says it's because of scarcity. It's a scarcity narrative that the hierarchs love. Abundance, resource abundance is the other narrative. And degra resource degradation is the other narrative. Now, the argument I'm trying to make here is, the way you're organized lets you define what the problem is. And if your problem definition is different, and this happens all the time in the social sciences, if your problem definition is different, your solution is going to be even more different. That you can be sure. Okay. And this is where the problem is. So therefore, when you have situation of climate uncertainty, physical uncertainty, you have all sorts of uncertainties going on, what we really need is not one perfectly optimized solution, which is what engineering and economics tries to tell you. you know? What you need is many 10% solutions. Because with many 10% solutions, some might work, some might not work. Some might work more than 10%, give you 15 or 20% even. Some might be zero. But you have hedged your risk much better. So water scarcity problems have to be handled with some, you know, refitting of flushes, some building of dams, some water recycling, some private, you know, tankers. There's a whole lot of solutions that we should be trying simultaneously. Unfortunately, our water management institutions are stuck in a single mode. Now, why are they stuck? Because, you know, the, the three-legged policy stool, as I call it, happy is a situation in a country if all these three, sorry, if all these three are actually in a constructive engagement. Unfortunately, there's a very, very falling apart, not listening to the other voices. I find, when I was a minister, my biggest problem as an academic who ended up being a minister by sheer fluke or accident or whatever, my bigger problem was my own water scientists. Because they were refusing to even listen to the other voices. I had, I had a hydrocrat come to me and say, sir, you shouldn't even consider this solar. Solar is useless. I mean, this is a dam builder, and to him, solar was a threat. Now, we already have a lot of solar going on. I had to tell him, I said, listen, are you listening? You know, I mean, and you're providing 15 hours of power cuts a day, and somebody wants to install a solar in his house. Why are you opposing it? But to him, it was a threat, you know, so that's how they function. So you find out that the exercise of power, there are three types of power. This is coercive power, this is persuasive power, and this is moral high ground power, you know. And these three types of power have to be given space. And that's how you come to a sustainable solution. My argument is that you cannot get sustainability just by regulation and procedures. Rules, rules will only take you so far. You will not get sustainability only by, you know, freedom of market. 
you know? And you will not get sustainability if you keep the activist egalitarian voice out. You have to have all three voices. They cannot agree, they will not agree. But if they are constructively engaged, and if one has learned to listen to the other voices, other definition of the problem, maybe they can redefine their own problem in a different way and probably come to compromises. Otherwise, there, there will not be much of a chance. Now, talking of water and poverty, I want to show this picture because it's a very interesting picture in Nepal. You know, uh, there was a Palestinian friend who had come by, uh, taking him around, and this guy kept ask, arguing that Nepal is not a poor country because if you live in Palestine, I believe, if you have something as green as this, it can't be poor. You know, these are orchards, you know, all sorts of orchards, oranges and all them. Huh? It's not poor. But the villagers living here think they are poor. Why? Because the water source is down here. You live up here or down here and you live up here. You have to carry the water every day. And there is no electricity in that village for pumping. Also, there is no road. There's a desperate attempt to build a road over here. It's, I think now succeeded, but not yet. So because they didn't have water, electricity and road, they considered themselves poor. So poverty, again, there are two types. One is voluntary poverty of the fakirs and uh, you know, greens who say we will not take this. But there's the involuntary poverty that we are all talking about. The involunt like involuntary resettlement. If we talk about involuntary poverty, then maybe we're going somewhere. Because involuntary poverty means somebody is coerced into being in, in a poor situation by a set of circumstances or set of uh, structures in place. This is the famous breach of the Kosi embankment in 2008. And uh, people are pauperized, as Blanca just mentioned, by extreme flood and extreme drought. They are wiped out. These were pretty prosperous people, and uh, that breach meant they had to, you know, their, their, their prosperous village where they grew vegetables and sold at the market is under six feet of sand now. Okay. The trouble is, this is what happened, the Kosi River breached. Now, again, toad's eye science instead of eagle eye science. This is a very eagle eye picture. The trouble is, I argue this is not a flood. It looks like a flood. Yeah, of course it's a flood, you know, all that water there. The trouble is the river was only at 60% of the average flow for that month. So when a river is only at 60% of the average flow, you can't call it a flood. So what happened? Answer, garden variety corruption. When this embankment was built, after the breach you could see, it was not built as an embankment, you know, it had no core clay, it had no nothing. It was just sand piled up by a corrupt contractor. And this kind of breaches have happened, you know, eight other times. But this came to light only because it happened in Nepal, and it affected 3.5 million people in Bihar and 65,000 in Nepal, and there was a lot of press. Unless a disaster is made a disaster by a press, it's not a disaster. Okay. 106 people were wiped out by a landslide once. Nobody knew about it except for two months later. So it's not even a disaster. Okay. So this is a critical issue. Now, coming back to science, what I'm trying to argue here is that what is information to one social solidarity of the four or the three I showed you may be noise to another. And this is where the real fight between market, government, and green egalitarianism comes to play. What you have over here, interesting, sorry, what you have over here is government institutions where who has the right to take what information from outside and who has the right to give away some information is very strongly regulated and the process is registration. Has something been properly registered and so on and so forth. You know, we talk of IPCC. The problem with IPCC is basically that it's, 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 it's something that produces a report from peer-reviewed document. If it's not peer-reviewed document, it's not information. So what this means is you know, what the farmer's knowledge there is in Nepal or Burundi or wherever is not knowledge, it's not information, it's filtered out. It's as real as any to you and me, but the point is it's not information, it's not registered. You have the egalitarian crowd where dialogue is the big problem and the institutional filter here, unlike here which is procedure, here it is charismatic activists, you know, who have the big voice. And in the individualistic world of businessmen and contractors and consultants, it's data filter. They are the ones who decide what is information and what is noise. And of course, the poor fatalist couch, couch potato up here, you know, you know, whatever the broadcaster gives me, I just take, I don't 
challenge, and so on and so forth. So again, when we talk science and we talk data, you say, whose data? Whose data? It's extremely important who generated the data and for what was it generated. So just because it is data and it is published in a peer-reviewed journal doesn't mean that it's the whole truth. Something else is going on down there which was never recorded, which is there in the lives and memories of people who don't write in English and don't publish in scientific journals. You know, and strange things are happening there. I'm coming to the end. So when we talk of MDGs and SDGs that are being negotiated right now, there's a conventional understanding that you're going to get a treaty like this because in the UN, with Mr. Ban Ki-moon sitting there, you're going to get all kinds of countries coming and coming to a consensus and you'll have a treaty, okay? And that's the standard old assumption. It unfortunately seems to work like that but doesn't work like that. Because the reality is this is how it works. You know, yeah, you still have nation states. You can't do away with them. They're there, you know. I carry a Nepali passport. You may carry some other passport. They're there, yeah. The trouble is you have interweaving loyalties, interweaving uh, connections of environmental activists, multinational corporations, scientific and professional groups, non-governmental social organization. I mean, for me, what you guys think of my science and my writing is far more important as fellow scientists than what my minister thinks in Nepal. I, mean, I couldn't give two hoots about what the minister thinks, but I would really worry if Julian thought my writing was crap. <laughs> it would bother me. So this is where these interweaving solidarities and the nation states, they come to a consensus. Example, ozone treaty. This is exactly how it happened. And it's successful, it's there. Kyoto is not going anywhere because these interweaving solidarities have never really been properly taken into account. Yeah, they make, some of them make a lot of noise, but there is a lot of failure going on there. Rhine cleanup, it happened. Precisely because all these things were working, especially at the level of cantons and landers, and the Rhine is cleaned up. The Ganges is not. Okay. So there's a lot to learn from exactly how the social sciences really function and policy sciences really function. And so in conclusion, I would argue that when we talk water poverty and all these, you know, coalescing, the coalescing science poverty and sustainable resource stewardship, Water science, poverty, sustainability, and development, I, you know, they're all called wicked problems in a dance of what I would call entwined predicaments. One is running into the limits of the other, and they won't go away anytime soon. You know, this one conference of ours and SDG conference in New York later in the year or something in 2015, yeah, they'll be there. It's an ongoing process. Let's treat it as such. But to hope that that will solve all the problems is expecting too much. These are two wicked problems and too entwined to go away soon. We can hope for incremental Karl Popperian kind of incremental engineering and change, but if we hope that it'll be a grand master plan architecture, forget it. They can be dealt with what we call uncomfortable knowledge. You know, probably comfortable textbook knowledge got us into this mess in the first place. Now, how do we come to uncomfortable knowledge? You know, it must be generated, as far as I can see, for poverty and water from a toad's eye view. We've got a lot on already eagle's eye view. We have very little on toad's eye science. And, sustainable, and, and in doing that, we have to see sustainability as a dynamic process. Unfortunately, sustainability is seen as a very static process that, you know, here is a, we are sustainable at this point. No, sustainability is an ongoing challenge in a constantly changing world where we are forever learning and never quite getting it right, but always striving to get better every day. So if, if sustainability is treated as such, we might end up somewhere, but if it's treated as static that, you know, this is sustainable, it'll never be. Involuntary poverty is relative, it's socially constructed, structurally maintained. There are too many people benefiting from poverty who would like to keep things that way. That must not be forgotten, you know. And they are coping the informal, the, through the informal system. And the informal system in many of our countries is about 80% of the economy. In most southern countries, formal economy may be accounting for only 20-30% of the economy. It's, the informal economy is the reality. The other is this superstructure, you might call it, you know, in some way, you know. And much of the eagle eye science has been completely blind to the informal economy. 
and water, resource management, forest, these are all in the informal kind of a sector. Fine. And then development, when we talk development, unfortunately, development has been hijacked to mean what the dominant hegemony says development is. The problem is a lot of the toads in the villages are defining their own development. They are also taking actions for intergenerational sustainability, the most sustainable institution being the family, sustained over generations. And they're doing that with their own um, actions. You know? And the trouble is, much of development science has not shown that Popperian humility, I would say. Popper was not a very humble man, from what I know. But you know, his science was that he argued that there's too much uncertainty and we cannot do this grand sort of you know, change. We must do it incrementally and learn at every incremental step. Okay. So, so finally, a way out really requires us to rethink development. Because the last 60 years of development has not produced much. There's a lot of chest thumping about MDGs being achieved. In my own country, you know, there's a lot of chest thumping that Nepal has overachieved this goal, like the former Soviet Union they used to do, that we overachieved our MDG goals. The problem is, as a toad's eye scientist, when you begin to look at the data, you find out, A, it had nothing to do with Nepal government policy or any donor policy. It happened because almost every house ended up sending a member of his family abroad and then and, and, and sent back remittances. 30% you know, of the GDP is now coming from re remittances. That changes everything. There was no government policy. There was no foreign aid uh, donor policy. So, you know, you suddenly find out that's not... Uh, you suddenly find out that Nepal is supposed to have achieved, you know, great success in electricity. Again, didn't happen because of any government policy. You found out that, you know, seven, uh, you know doubling of the capacity occurred because people were putting small generators in their own, uh, you know, basement and running their, you know, industries much more expensive, but doing it themselves, and that was completely blind. So what we need to understand sustainability as a clumsy process of informal sector households, the, how they define it over generations, and act accordingly, you know, and, and not for any national and international goals, because national and international goals have never really filtered down to the grassroots. Thank you.